Good afternoon. My name is Sue Mannion and I'm the manager of the Student Hub and I would like to welcome you all to our very first virtual introduction to private housing presentation. We know that this has been a very challenging year for you all with the majority of you carrying out your studies sitting in your room but we hope that the presentation today will help with the transition of moving from your halls to the next exciting part of your university journey by guiding you through the steps you will need to take on your journey to renting accommodation in the private sector. But first, I would like to introduce you to my team. Chelsea, Sophia and Emma are Student Hub Advisors and Michael is the senior student hub advisor. My team will be available throughout the presentation to answer your questions that are in the chat and after the presentation where we can answer some of your queries live. Hopefully the presentation will answer many of the concerns that you may have. If you see a question in the chat, please like the question so that this will then let us know what the most popular subjects are. Now let's move on to why we're here. We are aware that moving from halls into the private sector can be somewhat daunting and we hope this talk will provide some answers to questions you may have, eliminate some of your anxieties and guide you through the housing journey you will most likely be taking. But don't worry about taking in all the information at once. This presentation will be available online and we are going to be carrying out the second half this presentation in May during our May Housing Mayhem Month, but more about that later. So what are we going to talk to you about? As you can see from the slide, this would be the whole journey that you would be taking. However, we will talk to you about the first part of your journey from who to live with, through to where and when to look, what type of accommodation is out there and, and how much is it all going to cost. Do your research before you jump into any of the search processes, arming yourself with essential knowledge on what you're looking for, what your budget is and where you want to live will not only ensure you find the ideal property, but will help to avoid being scammed or pressured into a decision. So let's think about your search timeline. Whilst you may have friends at other universities that have already found a house for next year, the London housing market does not operate. If we do start house hunting too early, agencies more often than not will ask you to pay rent for the period the property is vacant, as they will expect you to move in within a few weeks of viewing the accommodation. And this may then cause issues if you don't plan on moving in until September or are wishing to go home over the summer period, if we all can. However, some landlords registered on the Imperial Home Solutions site will let you view the accommodation now and start the contract in September. So during March, April and May, attend our housing events. Well done, you've passed the first test. Remember to sign up to our events during May, which will help you understand more about contracts and inventories and you don't because you don't want to end up being stuck in a contract and owing money. During June, July and August, you still have plenty of time to find your new home. This is a good time to start your private housing search with estate agents as they will have a better idea of availability for September and October. September left it to the last minute, but don't worry, there'll still be plenty of property available. October, November and December, move in, relax and start enjoying the next part of your university journey. So what should you do first and over the next couple of months? Do your research about where you want to live, how much it's going to cost and most importantly, who you're going to live with. The first step in your private housing journey will be to decide on who you would like to live with. Some of you may decide to live alone, but the majority of you moving into the private sector, you'll form some small groups. Consider the following factors before renting together. Who do you want to live with next year? Do you already know them? 
choosing the right flatmate is a very important decision as part of your journey. We know that this year has been particularly difficult to form groups due to the majority of you being in your rooms or still at home working remotely. However, we do have plans in place to help you find others to live with. I will give you more information about finding a flatmate and what events we have coming up to assist you later in the presentation. But first, be honest about yourself and what you want. Don't pretend to be a party animal if realistically you would rather stay in and go to bed at nine o'clock. Be certain about the type of personalities you would like to live with. That way you can be sure to find like-minded people, which will in turn hopefully lead to a much more positive and happier living environment. Like I said, think about the person you are. Are you excessively tidy and hates the slightest speck of dust? Or do you not even know what a vacuum is? People have differing standards as to what they consider as tidy. Are you a lively soul who is looking to have fun and party? Or are you hoping to live in a state of peace and quiet? And if you are un unaware of the world existing prior to midday, it could be problematic if you choose to live with an early riser. And everybody likes a visitor and having your friends or partners stay over. However, consider how frequent this may be, particularly if they aren't paying rent and yet are using and, and utilising the household resources. And don't let money get in the way of a friendship. Budgeting can affect not only the type of property you rent and where you live, but also your social life. It could be very isolating if you couldn't afford to be out as often as the rest of your housemates. And if you have a particular diet, think about how you would feel sharing a house where people may be cooking dishes that you really don't like. And think about how long you're going to be in the property. The majority of landlords will want you to sign a 12 month tenancy or longer. You will need to discuss with your landlord whether you can replace yourself within the contract if you do not want to stay for the full length of the tenancy. And remember, not all landlords will permit this and there is usually a cost involved. These are all the questions you should be asking yourself to help you with this. Don't forget to check out the private housing guide online. It has some great tips for living together. But our general advice is that before choosing to move in with people, have a frank discussion about your habits and perhaps establish a basic set of principles. So you are under no illusions about what you or others expect from a house share because once you've signed that contract, it will be difficult to get out of it at a later date. So we know that many of you are concerned about finding people to live with for next year, and our team have created a Yammer group called Find a Flatmate 2020-21, where you will have the chance to talk with fellow students who are also searching for flatmates. We will be providing opportunities for you to discuss with students in the group and feel free to post in this to get to know other students. Keep in mind that the group will be monitored by my team, so please be respectful. We will also be hosting flatmate events in the coming months, so keep an eye out for these. And a link will be provided in the chat for you to request to join the group and then let the flatmate finding begin. I'm now going to hand you over to Michael. Thank you, Sue. Um, so where, where to look? Well, there are many places to look for accommodation. Most of you will do your searching online. There are plenty of websites that advertise spare rooms or available flats, but it's worth looking for sites and listings that specifically cater to students, such as Imperial Home Solutions. We understand that beginning your property search in London can be slightly daunting. Imperial Home Solutions has been created as a secure site for Imperial students only that gives you all access to a variety of housing options centred in one place. The website has listings for over 400 private landlords, as well as contact details for a range of private hall providers and estate agents. There is also a student message board where you can get in touch with other students looking for accommodation or housemates to live with. All of the landlords and agents advertising on Imperial Home Solutions are required to give contact information and copies of required safety documentation 
such as gas safety certificates. Alongside this, a large number of the private landlords advertising have been working with closely with the college for a number of years and are very familiar with Imperial students and their housing needs. The site will be updated throughout the coming months with the latest news and useful articles to help you in your property search. The next step is to decide what type of accommodation you'd like. This is directly influenced by the number of people you want to live with and your budget. The first example we're going to look at is a room in a shared house or flat. So if there is a group of four or more, then the chances are you'll be looking for a house share. This can also be the cheaper way to rent accommodation as you can spread the cost of the bills between you. If there is a group of you renting together, some landlords will allow you to use the living room as a bedroom, which will cut down costs as there are more of you sharing. Alternatively, you may wish to live alone, in which case you'll be looking for a studio or bed sit. However, remember that you'll be the only one paying the bills, so ensure you factor this into your budget. Other options are to look at living with a resident landlord, so essentially lodging. You'd be signing a different type of contract though, which is called a license. This only gives you a permission to occupy and does not give you the same security as an assured shorthold tenancy agreement. However, this may be good for some of you as it can be cheaper or alternatively, you could return to purpose built student halls in the private sector. When deciding on the different types of accommodation with your flatmates, you have to be realistic and may have to compromise. Unless you have a massive budget, you may not find the perfect property. You need to decide what's important for you and remember that you won't be living in the property forever. So, so be flexible. So we've looked at the different types of accommodation you might like, but it's really important to think of where you might like to live. Are you happy to live in the city centre or would you prefer somewhere slightly more suburban and further afield? This map shows where most of our students live and it's in the area guide we have produced online. As you can see, we've used Acton Town as an example. We've calculated the average rent per week and the travel options to South Kensington and the White City campuses to help you choose an area which best suits your needs. We'd all like to live locally to the college, but you may have to live further out due to your budget. Once again, it's all about having to compromise to get the property you can afford. Have a think about the travel connections, the amenities in the local area, and check out the area during the day and the evening. If you're going to the area in the evening, take a friend with you. Think about your personal safety. In addition to the area guide, we've produced a number of online 60 second video clips of some of the more popular areas for our Imperial students. The videos can be viewed on our student hub web pages. OK, so you've decided who you'd like to live with. Now it's time to think about your budget. How much are you actually going to need to spend? Well, rent will be your first major cost with Imperial students in the private sector paying anything from 150 to 220 pounds per week per person on rent, depending on how many there are in the group and the type of property you decide on. However, you'll need to budget for other weekly costs. Bills, for example, water, gas, electricity, mobile and internet costs, we estimate at approximately 25 to 30 pounds per week per person. Remember that you don't have to pay council tax, so please make sure you visit My Imperial for a council tax exemption letter and send this off to the local council when you move into private accommodation. And don't forget to set aside a budget for food. Shop together if you all like the same thing. You may also find it useful to start a kitty and share the costs of essential household items between you. Travel. Remember to factor in the cost of travelling to and from college on the bus or the train. As full time students, you'll be eligible for a 30% discount from TfL. And finally, socialising, whether that be an evening out or a trip to the cinema, remember to set aside some money for socialising. So depending on how many of you are sharing or whether you're renting alone, we estimate that you should each budget for between 300 and 380 pounds per week. Again, please bear in mind 
that in deciding to live alone, your costs will be significantly higher and you will be solely responsible for the bills. Fees and deposits. So when you start to look for private accommodation, you'll need to think about the additional costs listed on this slide. If you do decide to rent your accommodation for an agent, you'll find yourself paying various fees. These fees are paid before you move into your new house or flat. The first one we're going to look at is the holding deposit. This is the amount of money that you pay to an agent to hold the property for you and for them not to rent the property to anyone else whilst your references are being checked. Most agents will charge you a holding deposit, which is usually a week's rent. If you then go on to rent the property, this money will become part of your security deposit. But please be aware, if you pay a holding deposit and then change your mind, you'll lose the money you have paid. So only pay a holding deposit once you're sure you want to take the property. Secondly, a security deposit. Once you've agreed to take the property, the agent will want you to pay the security deposit, which in most cases will be five weeks rent. This is the money that the landlord or the agent will hold until the end of your tenancy. Moving on, we're going to look at rent, which is usually one calendar month's rent up front. However, if you don't have a UK based guarantor, the agent could ask you to pay up to six months rent in advance. There are also additional charges to consider. Late payment charges, for example, if you don't pay your rent on time. Charges if you want to replace one of your group midway through the tenancy. And possible charges if you wish to surrender the tenancy, if you are permitted to terminate early. Due to the pandemic, many landlords and agents are now using different methods to showcase their properties. These include 360 degree tours, live video tours via WhatsApp, FaceTime or Skype. So things are very different. Whilst this does go some way to showing you a property, it's really not a substitute for the real thing. We strongly advise caution against paying a holding deposit or signing a contract for a property you've not actually seen in person. We advise that you request a live virtual tour so that you can see the property in real time. Make sure that you get any verbal promises in writing to manage the risks prevented by the virus. What to look for and ask? Well, when viewing a property, whether that be in person or virtually, try to keep out, try to keep a lookout for the points we've listed on this slide where possible. In particular, is there enough furniture present for the number of people renting the property? Can you see any obvious signs of damp mould or drafts? And does the kitchen have cooking facilities and storage? Thanks, Michael. Um, now, I have the good job of giving you some legal information. Remember, contracts are legally binding documents and there's two different types of contract. One is an insured short hold tenancy, which you would sign if you're renting the whole accommodation as a group. And the other is a license, which you would sign if you're going to live in an accommodation with a resident landlord. However, a change in your circumstance won't necessarily enable you to leave your legal obligations and the pandemic has not changed the laws regarding ending tenancies. Take your time to decide and if in doubt, contact the student hub. Because if, for example, your rent was £200 per week, you would be liable for £10,400 for the year. So you need to be sure when you're signing a contract. Protect yourself. Look for a provider offering cancellation policies or flexibility for students. These would normally be private hall providers, not all estate agents or uh, private landlords will be that flexible. They'll want you to sign a contract and pay the money. Uh, add a break clause to your contract and this will allow you to leave without penalty after a set amount of time. Usually you have to stay in a property for a minimum period of six months. 
and check to see whether you can add a COVID clause or an addendum to your agreement, especially if you are especially helpful if you're viewing virtually. And use the flow chart to see what additional clauses may be help, helpful to add to the tenancy agreement. And look into short term accommodation to allow you to search in person. There are a number of hostels local to South Kensington campus. So from June 2019, the Tenants Fees Act became law and landlords are not permitted to make unnecessary charges, which is great for us. You cannot be charged for cleaning, although you will be expected to leave the property in the same condition as it was when you moved in. And you will not have to pay for infantry check-ins or out, but I would advise you to check the inventory thoroughly when you move in, take photos and advise the landlord or agent as soon as possible about any discrepancies. And remember to put this in writing. Also, when you leave the property, make sure you put all items back in the same place they were in when you moved in. The infantry clerk won't look for these and will mark them as missing and the landlord will charge you. And any charges the agent wishes to impose should be in the contract and displayed within the estate agent's office if you're going to rent your accommodation through the agent. But please check out the .gov website where there is a lot more information. One thing to consider when you visit an agent or a landlord is that they will ask you if you have the right to rent in the UK. In 2016, new legislation came into force that states that once you have found a property and have agreed to the terms and conditions with the agent or landlord, they will require you to prove that you have the right to rent the accommodation. To prove this, they will likely ask you for a copy of your passport and or your visa. And if you check the website shown on the screen, it will give you a full list of documentation that can be used. And as a result of COVID-19, there are temporary changes to the way you can check documents. Read the guidance about the adjusted process, including how landlords can ask for documents digitally, making checks on a video call, and what to do if a tenant cannot provide any accepted documents. We would strongly advise you not to give original copies of your documentation and do not allow agents or landlords to take your original documents away. If your landlord wishes to do this, we suggest that you copy the document yourself, show them the originals and then give them the copies. Again, the website provides lots of information on this. We also know that a number of you are concerned about proving whether you have the right to rent as you are not yet in the UK or you have not been able to pick up your BRPs. And we've spoken to our colleagues in the International Student Support Office who have advised. Well, normally, once a visa is granted, students would need to arrive in the UK, collect their BRP and then show this to the landlord. Due to the pandemic, students may be arriving at different times and in some cases it may be quite a bit of time after the visa has been granted. Student, students should make sure that they choose to have their BRP sent to Imperial and once the International Student Support Team receive the BRP at the college, they will scan it and upload it to your My Imperial site. So it will be possible to download an electronic copy from there and provide that to the landlord. In addition to the right to rent legislation, another aspect to consider is whether you require a rent guarantor. If you're looking to rent accommodation in the UK and want to pay your rent on a monthly basis, then you will most likely require a rent guarantor. Rent guarantors are commonly used by landlords and accommodation providers to ensure that the new tenant will not default on payments of rent. And a rent guarantor agrees to guarantee the payment of your rent to an agent or landlord in the event that you cannot. And this may be particularly useful for students being asked to make upfront payments of six to 12 months rent in advance. Paying large sums of money in advance can be risky or leave you in a difficult position. 
For example, should you need to vacate your property early for any reason, then any upfront money you have paid, the landlord does not have to return. But by Imperial acting as your rent guarantor, you will be able to pay rent monthly and protect yourself from risks such as these. The Imperial Rent Guarantor Scheme allows Imperial College to act as a UK based guarantor for all returning undergraduate students. Rent guarantees are done on an individual basis and cover accommodation up to the value of £250 per person per week. Um, the scheme has been running now for five years and we have over 600 successful rent guarantees being put in place. And the scheme will open again this year in April and you can find out more information about the scheme by visiting the link displayed. But some of you may think that you're not ready yet to have to deal with estate agents or private landlords and would prefer to live in a hall environment. Some private hall providers can be expensive and the accommodation tends to be a studio apartment and these can be very costly. However, we do have one hall of residence that is for returning students, Evening Gardens. It is in South Kensington, close to Gloucester Road Station, um, about a 15 minute walk, well, probably 15 minutes for you, me, my legs are a lot older, so it probably take me a little bit longer. And it's exclusively for returning undergraduates and it is on a 39 week contract for the next academic year, so more similar to what you would find in hall. There isn't a warden team at Evelyn, so students do live a bit more independently, but resident assistants and 24 hour concierge service are on hand if you need assistance. You also have the convenience of having all of your utility bills included, including internet and contents insurance. And there are a range of rooms available and prices start at £182 per week which compares quite favourably with private halls, which tend to be a little bit more expensive. Also, this hall will be open for this summer, but you will have to book for the full 10 weeks and the rent will be at the term time rent. Unfortunately, we are not able to do any short term bookings this year and applications for the summer will open from the beginning of April. We will also start taking applications for October from the end of April, so keep an eye out for further information. Obviously, Evelyn Gardens is a quite a small hall with only 250 beds and it is quite popular, so all applications will be on a first come, first serve basis. So let's recap what we said to you so far. So flatmates, most important. Think really carefully about who you would like to live with and agree on how much you can afford to pay for a property. Costs and fees, make sure you're all aware of the costs for holding and security deposits and that you can afford your share. And looking for a property, make sure you all agree on the area, go to visit at different times during the day, look at the local area, will you feel safe coming back late at night? and contracts. Make sure you read the contract and remember members of the Student Hub team will be able to check this for you. We're now going to show you a video showing what we've already told you about and what we're going to talk about during our May Housing Mayhem Month. Flatmates, you gotta love them. No, seriously, you do at least have to like them. It's also good to choose flatmates with the same schedules, budgets and priorities. So if you prefer, oh, I don't know, paying your rent on time and not setting fire to things, make sure your flatmates feel similarly. All that a short, short whole tenancy agreement could come back to bite you. With those boxes ticked, it's time to find a house. So, you've got your flatmates lined up, now for the house. There are various types of accommodation you could go for, but whatever you choose, make sure you go with an established estate agent. You can find a list of them, along with a cheeky offer or two at the Imperial Home Solutions site. Budget is your next consideration. Don't you just love being a responsible adult? Rent, 
bills, travel, and nothing says responsible adult like a spreadsheet. And finally, don't forget to check the area. That ensuite bathroom won't seem quite so appealing when you're stuck on a bus into uni from Zone 9. With all those boxes ticked, you can move on to paying your deposit. A holding deposit is the down payment you put on a property to secure it. The security deposit is the money that will be held back if you decide to paint the walls black and break down the door when you forget your keys. But whatever you do, don't pay any money before you've actually viewed the place. Always worth checking there aren't any nasty surprises hidden away in there. And when you do pay the deposit, make sure your landlord gives you the prescribed information, proving it's being kept in a protected scheme. You should get this within 30 days of paying. That is, unless you're living with your landlord, you lucky thing. In which case, your deposit doesn't have to be protected. You can find out more about insurance and deposit protection on our website. At last, all the hard work has paid off. It's moving day. Uh-uh, not so fast. You didn't think the work was done now, did you? Oh, you poor deluded fools. First, you need to make sure a check-in inventory is done. This is a list of everything in the property on the day you move in. It'll be compared to the check-out inventory. So make sure you can account for everything, from the number of teaspoons to, well, the bigger stuff. If you want to be really safe, take your own photos of any damage in the property, no matter how small, so that you don't run the risk of being blamed for it when you leave. It's worth the effort to make sure you get your deposit back. It means you can sit back, relax, and enjoy your new home. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. There is an awful lot to think about with private accommodation and we don't expect you to take everything in at once. So in May, we're going to have a series of events. At the end of May, we will also be holding a virtual exhibition where you'll be able to meet estate agents, private hall providers and some landlords. And we will also be carrying out the second half of this talk where we'll give you more information about private housing contracts, inventories, deposits, and maintenance and repairs. And as I've said during May's presentation, we're going to give you more information about contracts. What are the different types of contract? What should be in a contract? Where can you get advice and information? Obviously, your first point of contact should be the student hub. And deposits, what is a holding deposit? What is a security deposit? Where will your deposit be protected and how can you make sure that this has been done? And moving in and out, things you should do when you move in and move out, such as informing the utility companies and the local authority that you are the new tenants as you don't want to pay the previous tenants bills. And what can you do if things go wrong, such as communicate with your landlord or agent and do not ignore problems as these could potentially cost you money. For example, if you have a leaking pipe and you don't inform the landlord or an agent and then that pipe bursts and floods the property, you could potentially be held liable as you did not inform anybody who could have repaired the pipe before it caused damage. And remember, the landlord can't fix a problem if they don't know about it. And remember, if you sign an insured short hold tenancy, you will be joint and severally liable for any damage caused in the flat. And you might want to take out liability insurance in case your flatmate floods the bathroom or burns a hole in the carpet. And that's happened many a time. And remember, the Student Hub team are here all year round. So if you're having difficulties getting something resolved, you can come to the Student Hub for advice. And that is just a snippet of what we will talk to you about when we do our next presentation in May. And that just leaves me to say a big thank you for you all to come to our first ever virtual introduction to private housing presentation. And this presentation will be available online and slides and everything will be published. And we would love to know what you think about the presentation today. And if you complete the form via the link that is in the chat, you could win yourself a hundred pounds Amazon voucher which I think is brilliant. And now myself and my team will now hopefully be able to answer some of your questions. Thank you. 
Hi, so yeah, we will now move on to start the Q&A. Um, please put any of the questions um, you have in the Q&A box. And if someone's already asked one, please remember to like it. Um, we will go by the most liked questions to answer first. Um, so we'll begin with a few questions that we had um, been sent in before the event, and then we'll move on to the most liked questions from the Q&A. So um, to start with, I think, we have one that sent in asking what happens if um, I wanted to leave or move out before the contract ends. So I think if Emma, if you're happy to take this. Yes, so um, you'll be liable for your, all of your rent and bills until your contract is legally ended. Um, so if you aren't confident that you'll want to stay in the property for more than a year, then don't be tempted to sign a longer contract than that because it would be difficult for you to leave. Uh, if you do find that your circumstances change, your landlord may allow you to find a replacement tenant on your contract. However, there's no guarantee that they'll allow you to do this and then there is likely to be fees involved. Um, and you must never uh, move any new tenant into the property without the landlord's written permission as you would still be bound by the contract. Um, and I think we did go over it a bit in the presentation, but um, as online teaching has been made, has made it difficult to meet people this year. Um, do you have suggestions on how to find future flatmates? Um, Chelsea, if you'd like to take. Uh, yeah, um, so we know that many of you are worried about finding people to live with um, as a lot of you have been studying remotely or haven't had the chance to meet people this year, um, but not to worry. Um, as Sue mentioned in the presentation, we have the Find a Flatmate group, um, so please join that. Um, and in the coming months, we'll also be hosting flatmate events, so keep an eye out for um, information regarding those events. Um, so I'll move on to a few from the chat as we had quite a lot of questions in. Um, one of it is we have, is it easier to find a property with a large number of people, um, four and five students or around two to three students? Uh, Sue, would you be able to take that? Um, I think it really does depend on where the area that you want to live in. Sorry, the area that you want to live in. Um, so but yes, I mean, it probably is better to have a smaller group of uh, three or four rather than the bigger groups, because if you went and rented a property for three people, you could rent a two bedroom and convert the lounge, which would make it slightly cheaper. Um, following on from a section Michael did in the presentation, if you'd like to take this one, it's about bills. Um, how much of the hidden costs of renting a property? Most advertisements only include the cost of the rent um, without electricity and water. Thank you, Sophia. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we estimated that um, our Imperial students should set aside um, 25 to 30 pounds per week per person. Um, for any any hidden bills or costs. Um, if you are renting as a group, um, I think that gives you more scope to to spread some of these costs between you um, in comparison to those who are choosing to maybe rent alone in a, a studio or a bed sit or one one bed apartment. Thank you. Um, so we have a question about belongings. Um, so where can we store our belongings over the summer? Is it common for students to use self storage? Um, Chelsea, would you be okay to that? Um, sorry, can you repeat the last part of that? Yeah. <laughs> um, where can we store our belongings over the summer? And is it common for students to use self storage? Um, so we do have um, a few links on our web pages of storage companies that you might be able to use. Um, you could also, if you have um, a property sorted out, you could ask the landlord if you were able to um, store your belongings, but that may come with um, fees, so you'd have to ask them about that first. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add about that, Sue. 
Yeah, the majority of landlords will, um, if you're going to move in in October, uh, they may still have students in there, so they probably wouldn't let you uh, store their belongings. So the best thing for you to do would be to find a storage unit. They're not very expensive and there's loads um, all around London. And that, as I said, as uh, Chelsea's already said, there is quite a few um, on our website. Great, thank you. Um, so I think another one for Sue. Um, do you have any tips on how to negotiate negotiate lower rent prices? Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, ask. That's the thing. Don't be pulled into um, landlords or agents saying, well, if you I'll let you have a lower rent if you rent the property for longer because this could cost you more money in the long run if you realise that you, you don't want it for longer, um, but you're, you're going to sign a longer contract just to get a lower rent because they can charge you if you want to replace yourself you know, into, into contracts. So, you know, if you want a lower rent, you need to be able to tell the landlord why. You need to be able to say to them, well, I'll be a really good tenant. I will, and, you know, some students say, yeah, I'll pay you the whole year's rent up front. I mean, there is dangers in that, but that could potentially get you a lower rent, slightly lower, probably about five pounds a week. I wouldn't think that the landlords will give you much more. Um, so we have one about private halls. Um, do any of the private halls offer contracts just for the three terms? Um, I don't want to need, don't want to or don't need to stay during the summer as I can go back to my parents. Um, if, Emma, are you happy to take that one? Yeah, I think some of the private halls do. Um, you need to sort of check with them individually. They all have their um, contracts. Um, I think for a variety, some of them are different contract lengths, uh, particularly because um, to see they sometimes have postgraduates staying there as well on um, along with longer term dates. Um, so yeah, you just need to see what they had available. And some of them do offer short term accommodation over the summer as well sometimes. Thank you. So um, we've got, is it possible to search for accom accommodation from abroad due to travel restrictions right now? And how would you suggest doing this? Um, Michael, if you're happy. Uh, yes, it is possible. Um, but there isn't any real substitute, unfortunately, for seeing something in person in real time. Um, but you can request, um, you know, that the potential agent or landlord gives you um, a real time virtual tour of the flat or the house that you're looking at. Um, but yeah, the, the best thing, if possible, is to actually view the, the property in person um, to give you the best feel for it. So we've got a couple of questions about um, guarantors, so it might be useful to do these um, at the same time. So um, for a start, it's uh, can EU or international students get guarantors and who can be a guarantor? Is there anyone um, who is a British, British citizen? Um, Sue, would you like to share this one? Yeah, OK. Um, a, a guarantor has to be UK based and it can be your parent or it can be a guardian or it can be imperial. Um, if it is a parent or a guardian, then they have to prove that they can afford to be to pay all of their outgoing bills plus your rent on top of you know, their um, what they have coming out as well in order to be a guarantor. But yes, you, you can have whoever. There's a company called Housing Hand. They will always act, they can act as a guarantor as well um, because we only act for undergraduate students. So if you're a postgraduate student, um, I would recommend or I would advise you to speak to Housing Hand if you wanted them to be a guarantor. Thank you. Um, so next up. 
let's have a look. Um, so we actually have someone here who's asking if I'd like some personal advice about renting a private accommodation, should I just email the student hub and um, get a one to one cons consultation session? Um, so I'll just answer this. Um, yes, um, you're more than welcome just to email us in with any questions. If you'd like to ask us specific ones, um, you can email us and we can um, go through your specific questions that you have either about a house or how to search. So next um, we have. Um, so I and my flatmates have bonded well and plan to live together next year. We have already found somewhere and we're planning on visiting it tomorrow. Are there any potential traps or shortfalls we may be subject to that we are unaware of before we jump into signing a contract? We are looking at signing soon as the property is popular. Uh, if Michael, you're happy to take this. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. Um, I would say maybe the most important thing to consider is um, that if you do opt for a longer term tenancy, so if you you sign up for you know 12 months or more importantly two years, that you ask for um, a break clause to be inserted um, to give you some flexibility, and you check what's actually provided um, in the property in terms of the, the furniture, and you get a commitment in writing um as to um to what's what's in the property sorry also as well with that one um if you're going to look at the property tomorrow when does the agent or the landlord want you to take the property from so you need to think very carefully about that. Do they want you to take it now? Are you already in a contract? Are you already in halls that you are paying, already paying uh, rent? Are you already in a private accommodation at the moment? So you need to think about carefully about what your commitment is at the moment before you sign a contract or think about renting accommodation in the future, when that's going to be, when you've got to pay the money and how much money you've got to pay in upfront. So you need to ask all of those questions as well. Thanks, Sue. Um, so Chelsea, I have one um, here for you. Um, is there any good agencies that the Student Hub recommends? Um. Um, yeah, so we wouldn't recommend necessarily a specific um, letting agent or private hall, but we do have um, letting agents and private halls that advertise with us. So you can find those on our web pages. Um, and then as mentioned in the presentation, we have Imperial Home Solutions, so private landlords can advertise there. Um, but you'd have to do your research and look at the property um, and talk to the landlord. We don't recommend specific um, agents. Thank you. Um, so for when we when moving into a property um, and you take photos upon moving in, um, what do you do with the photos, um, especially if they show signs of damages? Emma, are you able to help that? Yeah, so you should always do um, an inventory check in whenever you move into a property and you don't have to just accept the inventory as it's handed to you by um, the landlord because it may be that it's sort of um, a version from the, the tenants that were there before. There might be things that you need to update on there. So any sort of damage or uh, you, you'd send an email with the tenancy agreement with any adjustments that you've made on there with your inventory um, and make a note of anything that you think needs to be updated on there and also um, during the your stay in the accommodation if anything needs repairing um, or any work is done make sure that you update that in an email to the landlord or agent as well so that you've got a thorough record for when you're moving out thank you um, so we have another one about a rent guarantor scheme and I think I'm going to send this one to Chelsea if I can. Um, if we want to apply for a rent guarantor scheme, what do we need to provide to show that we have the possibility to pay rent? Um, and do we need to show that we already have the full amount required for next year? Um, yep, yeah, so in the application process, we'll ask you um, to provide the um, evidence that you have enough funds. Um, that could be through a bank statement um, or um, proof of a maintenance loan. Um, I don't know if there's any other documents. So would you be able to um, add if there's anything I missed? Uh, 
no, you would just need to supply your uh, bank statements to show that you can afford to pay the rent. Um, obviously, the landlord would need to complete the documentation as well, and the landlord would need to um, comply with the standards that we've set with regard to COVID clauses that we've added and addendums uh, to the tenancy agreement. Just following on from something you actually just said, Sue, um, we had a question which asked what do COVID-19 clauses or addendums mean? Are you able to just explain why they might be put in? Yeah, we found that last year we had quite a lot of students that found themselves that they were stuck in some of the contracts. So as part of the rent guarantor scheme, we asked our landlords um, if they would add some addendums um, and some clauses to their contracts in order to protect them and to protect the students if they needed to leave the accommodation. And these are part of the standards that we set as part of the rent guarantee scheme. And if you look um, on the flow chart that I showed, um, it will show what clauses and addendums are needed um, at certain uh, times of when you're signing the contract. And that is all online or you're welcome to give us a ring and we can go through it with you and explain it more fully. Hope that helps. Thanks. Um, so we had, do you recommend waiting until the next presentation to finalise accommodation? Um, there's some worries about places will be gone. Um, Michael, would you be able to take this? Please? Yeah, I, I don't think um, our students should be in any rush to, um, to secure housing. Um, they still have more than enough time to wait until the next event that we're hosting um, before making any final decisions. Um, and as Sue has mentioned previously, you know, please be very careful before you enter into contracts and sign things. Um, you know, consider all of your options and do your homework first. Um, so we had a couple of questions earlier on regarding Imperial Home Solutions. Um, people were asking about how they can have access and um, how they can use it to search. Uh, Chelsea, are you able to give a bit of an overview? Yeah, so Imperial Home Solutions is a secure platform, um, so only registered students and staff can access it. Um, so you'll need to be a registered uh, student or staff member if you want to look at the properties available on there. Um, if you are an incoming student, um, you can ask us for a guest password, but you'll need to have an unconditional offer. So we won't be able to give you the guest password um, if you still have a conditional offer. Once you've received that unconditional offer, you can just pop us an email and then we can give you the guest password. Thank you. Um, so we have some more questions about bills. Do the majority of landlords include gas and electricity bills within the rent or is it generally always separate? Emma, are you happy to be today? It's usually separate. So if you're renting a uh, house share insured your tenancy, um, it, you, it will normally stay in there and will be expected that you as a household will be responsible for organising all of your utility bills, um, having your names um, on those bills and paying them regularly. Um, if though you're sharing with a living landlord, um, it's normally that would be that would be more complicated. So that's usually only the, the only occasions where rent and bills where uh, bills would be included in your rent. Um, so due to the summer holidays, it's likely that I'm going to sign a contract for an apartment with friends before the end of the academic, before the end of the academic year, so in June, um, but won't move in until September. And is it possible to not start paying rent until September? Uh, Sue, would you appreciate that, please? Yeah, as, as we've said previously, if you sign a contract, you will start paying rent from the start of that contract. Um, and that's what landlords will expect you to do. So if you sign a contract in June, the landlord will expect you to pay for accommodation from June. You can you know, speak to the agent or the landlord and ask if you can have a reduction as you won't be there, but they won't always. Some landlords will give you a bit of a reduction if you're not going to be there, um, but the majority of them won't. So once you sign the contract, you're going to be bound by paying rent for that contract from when it starts. 
Um, I think quite a good follow on from that, just if they have got a property um, someone's asking if they want to keep a property for the next year, um, what's a renewal process like? Are you able to just speak about that? Yeah, of course. If you've um, signed a tenancy for 12 months and you really like living there, that it's a really good landlord, it's in an area you like and you're happy and you want to renew, two months before the tenancy is due to come to an end, um, contact the agent or the landlord and ask them if you can renew for an, uh, an additional year. And if you've been a really good tenant and paid your rent on time and calls the landlord or the agent, no problem, they'll be more than delighted for you to, uh, to stay there for an additional year because it means that they won't have advertising costs and they just, you know, just collect their rent. That's fine. Um, so we had one follow on from the bills question that Emma answered. Um, it was just if electricity bills are included, are there usually limits on how much um, that is included within it? And um, if you use too much, would you be likely to be charged more? Would you be able to elaborate, Emma? Yeah, so if your contract says that bills are included, make sure it's really specific. Um, what it says in your contract about what's included. Um, sometimes it just says utilities, make sure it lists exactly which utilities those are. Um, some, you know, some you might think as a, as a student that internet access, for example, the internet um, facility is a utility, whereas your landlord might not. So make sure if it's gas, electric, water included, make sure it's all listed. It would be unusual for um, there to be a limit on usage. Um, sometimes you do see contracts where it will say, um, unless it's more than a certain amount per week, but you'd really want to get some clarity on that because how are they going to measure how much electricity you're using during the week? Um, and also sort of, would you, would you get anything refunded if you paid less than that per week? So normally if bills are included, make sure it lists exactly which bills are included and that it's all of the bills rather than just a, a contribution towards, make sure it's very clear in the contract. Um, so we had one for international students. Is it um, mandatory to create a bank account in the UK before you're able to rent? Um, as do we need to share the bank details with the landlord? Um, Michael, would you be able to take that, please? Um, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, whether it's actually mandatory. Um, but I know that if you are transferring money from overseas um, or from a non-UK bank account, um, some of the landlords or agents will add charges on. Um, so from the, the point of simplicity, it's it's a lot easier to set up a payment arrangement with one of the agents if you do have a UK bank account. Um, so We, um, what advice would you be able to give regarding the coronavirus pandemic and potentially not paying rent during the lockdown? Sue? Unfortunately, if you've signed a contract, you are liable to pay the rent and the pandemic does not have any influence over that at all. So, um, yeah. If you signed a contract and you know, we go into lockdown again, you will still be required to pay your rent. There is absolutely no legislation anywhere. Um, the only legislation has been that if you don't pay your rent, the landlord is unable to evict you. But I can assure you that if you don't pay your rent, uh, the landlord, once they can, they will evict you and you will end up having to pay it anyway. So um, if you are having difficulties in paying the rent, negotiate, speak to the landlord, um, explain your circumstance. And as we went into lockdown last year and a lot of students had to leave their accommodation, um, we did send a letter to all of our agents and landlords who are registered with us and quite a lot of them released students and also reduced some of the rents to help them out. But there's no law to say that they've got to. So, you know, you need to be prepared that when you sign a contract and whatever the rent is, that is what you're going to be expected to pay. Thank you. Um, so we had a couple of questions about Evelyn Gardens as well, um, which I can 
take on. Um, so we had can someone living in Evelyn Gardens and has two more years of studies extend the contract for next year? And if yes, is it just for one year or can it be for the rest years? So as long as you're a continuing undergraduate student, you can um, apply for Evelyn Gardens. It does have to be done each year though. Um, so this year they'll open in April the application. So you'll have to apply then for 2021, 22. And then if you're still a student the year after, apply again. Um, we also had someone asked about um, if they could move in um, earlier than the contract is in September or something. So the 2021-22 contract will begin in October on, I believe it's the 2nd of October. Um, yeah, the 2nd of October. Uh, we will, as we said in the chat, we also do have a summer license, but it is for, for a full 10 weeks that you'd have to apply for. Um, those will be the dates of the licenses. So um, a few last questions we have are, um, do we need to do anything to prove, prove that we have council tax exemption? Uh, Chelsea, if you were able to take that one, please. Yeah, um, so you can find your statement of registration on My Imperial that can be used as a council tax exemption letter. Um, so you'll just have to go onto the My Documents tile of My Imperial. It'll ask you to sign in um, and then you should be able to go to the letters tab and just download the document. Um, the one thing about that is if they're requesting um, a copy that's not password protected, um, you might have to print it off directly from the portal and then scan it yourself in. Um, or it could be password protected because I think they have something on there about um, password protection. Uh, but yeah, it can be found on My Imperial. And if you have any issues with that, you can email into the Student Hub um, through the Ask portal and we'll be able to assist you with it. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just noticed there was a couple of additional ones about Evelyn from what I just said as well. Um, so when to applications opens was a common one. So that will be in April. Applications will open um, both of the summer license and for um, the new year. And someone asked, would they be able to stay during the summer, even if they're not staying there during the next year? Um, yes, if you're an undergraduate student, you can apply, um, but it will be for the full 10 week period, which will last from the 26th of June until um, the end of the first week of September. I believe the dates are. Um, so a few final ones. Um, let's have a look. So um, some of the pre questions as well. Um, we had. Um, I have not collected my BRP yet. How would this affect my right to rent? And um, Chelsea, if you could just answer that one. Yeah, so normally students would arrive in the UK and then would be expected to collect their BRP within a certain amount of time after their arrival. And due to the pandemic, this is for this process is slightly different as many of you have not arrived um, due to remote learning or have been unable to collect your BRP. Um, students should request for the BRP to be sent to international student support. Uh, if this is done, then they'll be able to upload this to My Imperial and you should be able to download a scan um, and send this to the landlord. The EU, EEA and Swiss nationals um, need a visa to study in the UK, um, they'll not be issued a BRP. So this visa will be digital and they should be provided a code which the landlord can check with the UK visa and immigration system to confirm uh, the visa details. Thank you. Um, so we had a further one about damage to a property. Um, how can you prove you haven't caused damage to a property when you move out, when people are already living there when you moved in? For example, if you rent by a spare room and like one person comes in and well enough goes out. Um, Sue, would you be able to take that? Uh, yeah, that's fine. So if you have gone in and replaced someone within a tenancy, um, yeah, it's very difficult to prove that you haven't caused any damage. But if you've gone in and uh, taken over the liability of someone else, you become part of the joint and several liability of that contract. And therefore, if there is any damage, you will be liable for your proportionate share, unfortunately. Um, if you move into a property with a group at the beginning, um, it's really important that you check the inventory and take your photographs, uh, keep them safe 
safe so that at the end of the tenancy you can prove that that's what it was like when you moved in and take photographs to prove that you've left it in the same condition when you moved out. But as I said, if you've taken over a liability, unfortunately you become part of uh, the joint and several liability of that group and you will be um, part of the charges. Yeah. Um, so another one about bills. I heard some electricity or gas providers are cheaper. Can we ask the landlord to change the electricity or gas provider or are we able to change it ourselves? Um, Michael, if you'd be happy to take this one. Um, generally speaking, you're not allowed to change um, provider without permission in writing from the landlord or the agent. Um, in most cases, I don't think it's something um, that the landlord or agent will want um, tenants to be doing. It's probably frowned upon. Um, there might be some price comparison websites that people can use nowadays to check um, which providers are slightly cheaper than others. Um, but most people will move in and just you know, you know keep the, the setup that's there um, and contact those companies when they move into the property um, to let them know that they're the new tenants and also do the same. Um, when they're preparing to leave. Thanks. Um, so we've had a few different questions um, that are generally asking about short term accommodation. Um, so I was wondering, Emma, if you'd be able to just give a little bit of an overview of where students can search or what the options are for short term if they're moving from one contract to another and have got a bit of time between. Yeah, so most um, contracts will be from minimum of six months, um, but you can still find some short term accommodation on Imperial Home Solutions. And if you rent accommodation with a live in landlord, uh, this is always more flexible, so this can be short term. Um, you might find that some of the private halls are offering short term accommodation over the summer as well. And there are some organisations such as Doctor in the House, which will organise homestays for students. And there's a range of independent host hostels near the campus as well, if you're looking for something very short term. Thank you. Um, another one I'm just going to pass you to, um, to you, Emma, if possible. Um, we had some questions about how they could apply to be a whole senior, if possible, of course. So if you've been in the halls and you've enjoyed living in the halls, then um, each of the wardening teams will recruit their own hall seniors. So um, undergraduates are going to stay in the halls for the next academic year and help organise uh, social events and um, support and welcome their incoming first years for the following year. They will normally advertise um, for all senior senior positions, usually each year around February time and you can apply through e-halls online to the individual halls and then the wardens will um, set up interviews and interview hall seniors for the, the income, next coming year. Um, so we have one, um, as an international student in halls, I'm already paying more than £250 per week and prepare to stay paying that amount. Um, but as an international student, I don't have a UK based guarantor. Does this mean I'm limited to properties up to 250 per week for next year? I'm assuming we should be able to take that one. Yeah. Um, as an individual, um, £250 if you're paying in, uh, just on your own is still quite low. You would probably have to pay more money than that if you were living on your own. But if you were part of a group and you were all paying £250, if there were three of you, that's £750 a week. So that's quite a high rent to be paying. And um, But you could all each individually apply uh, to the college um, for, for us to be a rent guarantor because we will guarantee you up to £250 per week individually. So it's probably better if you were going to um, live with uh, you know one other person or you know a group of two or three of you um, and then if you've got that sort of budget that's fine and we can we can act as a rent guarantor. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Um, and just another one about Imperial Home Solutions, we had someone say that when they use the search function, they can't um, find the private hall providers on it. Um, Chelsea, would you be able to just um, give a quick overview of how you can find about the private halls on Imperial? Yeah, so if you click the Find Providers um, button on the home page, it should take you to letting agents in private halls. Um, this is also on our accommodation web pages as well, which we can provide a link for that in the chat. 
also remember that on Imperial Home Solutions as well, there is a message board. So that's another search engine that you can use uh, for finding flatmates as well. Um, so I think just the last couple of questions now. Um, so one about these flatmate events. Um, will the upcoming Find a Flatmate events or the Yammer be available for incoming students um, with conditional offers only? Um, Chelsea, if you'd be able to. Yeah, so um, the Yammer group is only available to um, registered students. Um, so unfortunately, until until you get the unconditional offer or you're a registered student, we won't be able to add you um, to the group. Um, we can keep in mind um, regarding that and maybe discuss options of being able to include um, students in other activities, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure at the moment what what we would be able to do. Um, so I think maybe our final questions we've got, is there a way not to be liable if your flatmates don't pay their rent? Um, I think maybe a final one for Sue there. OK, so if you live, if you've signed in a short short whole tenancy, uh, for example, if there's three of you and one of that group doesn't pay their rent, the landlord would look to the other two to pay the rent on behalf of the third person who hasn't paid. So you, yes, you would be liable. However, if the person who's not paid the rent has a rent guarantor, then the landlord would look to the rent guarantor to pay the rent on that, on that student's behalf. So hopefully that answers the question. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think we've answered quite a lot of questions there today. Um, if there is any that we've missed, um, we will be putting any answer, unanswered questions up online. Um, they'll also be available with the recordings and the slides on the event pages. Um, but if, as we said earlier, if you have any specific questions you want to ask or any that you can ask you during the chat, please feel free to contact us by email and we'll be happy to help. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to hand back to Sue now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Sophia. Um, I'd just like to say a huge, huge thank you to everybody who joined the presentation today. I hope it's given you uh, food for thought um, and giving you some helpful information. Please remember to look on our web pages, look at the private housing guide and the area guide. It will also give you lots and lots of information. Um, and please don't forget to um, go get the Go to the link um, in the chat and fill out the form and you could potentially win a £100 Amazon voucher. So I just want to say again a huge, huge thank you and we'll see you again in May. Thank you. Bye bye.